do have, as you can see from the picture, it has been, um, it has it has a fencing around it, but it's not very secured, and it's in a very crowded space whereby there's taxis and motors passing by all the time. And services that are available at the community of Danone is that they have three primary schools, which are the primary schools that we work in as Jelly Beans, and it also has one high school. It has a library, but the children have have raised. Um, complaints about the library not being very child friendly and not enough stuff or adequate stuff to help them with regards to um, the books and the resources that they might need at the library. And us as Jelly Beans, the work that we do in schools. So if you see in the top picture, that is one in one of the schools that we work in is called, the name of the school is Silver Leaf. So when we, um, during the beginning of this year, when we started out with our services at the school, we've been working with the school for years now, but we didn't have adequate space for seeing the children. Um, and we, we, we sourced out funding to build a playroom. If you can see in the picture in the far bottom, we put up a prefurb in the school and decorated it such that it becomes more child friendly and it becomes a more comfortable space for the children to see us in. And so, like I mentioned earlier, we're seeing children in three primary schools and one ECD center. Um, we visit the community once a week or, or, or school once a week uh, on a weekly basis and we see the children in schools. We get very, very, very large numbers of referrals. It's not even enough as, as we are right now. We have a very long waiting list in the schools because the need is so great. And if I may just say that children in Danun don't go to school to learn, but they go to school for survival. And which leads us to reasons why this study or this paper was prompted. So as mentioned, um, myself and my colleague work in schools in Danun. With post COVID lockdown, we received a very high number of reported cases of children refusing to come to school. Teachers were feeling overwhelmed uh, with the stresses and the students non attendance. Um, there's no visibility of school attendance offices in the community of Danun. In fact, teacher, teachers have mentioned that they've never even seen a school attendant attendance officer, they have no knowledge of what they are or what they do or how to even access them. And despite the measures put in place with um, COVID associated anxieties, some of the children have not returned to school. And so it, 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 it made us wonder um, what else can be done to motivate children to come to school, to motivate children to want to go to school, because obviously what has been put in place right now is not working at least for not for these children in the Danun community and so we we had chats with the children some of the children that were referred some of the children that we we saw at the schools we drafted a set of questionnaires with with the answers that they gave us and as expected we expected the children to talk to about to talk to us about the anxieties they might have around the COVID virus or contacting the virus when they go back to school. But what surprised us is that um, it was part of the reasons, but it was not the larger reason why children were not going to school. And so we had the conversations with the children and from the conversations that we had with the children, we drafted a questionnaire which uh, now asked, um, larger numbers of the children in school and to help us to to try and understand better what can be done and um i remember in one of the conversations i had with the children i said to her if you were to be the president of south africa what measures would you put in place in order to um to, to motivate children to come back to school, because I think it's so important that we involve children in conversations about services that are, um, are catered for them. So the first uh, uh, on our pie chart, uh, on our graph, the first um, graph speaks about the acquired learning independence. So one of the children said to me, during lockdown, we were given the work over the phone and we were told to do the work. And before you could even finish or know what the answers are, then the teacher would send us back the work um, to correct ourselves, to mark ourselves and do the corrections without her knowing if 
we had done the work or not. And so for some children who were um, able to do the work, they would do the work, but for some children who were not able to do the work, they will just wait for the corrections and just write whatever is in the corrections that is sent by the teacher. And also this bearing in mind that this would work with children who have access to internet, children who have access to WhatsApp and all the other platforms that they received their work in. So in the in the first column of the acquired learning uh, independence, and so children, some of the children learned to do the work on their own. If I may just mention, I had a child who said to me, well, Auntie Yonella, I don't see the reason why I should come back to school. I have my work. It's always done. And, you know, um, we, we, we asked for her books to see if what she's saying is actually correct. And it actually was, she was doing the work at school. And so for her, she had acquired this independence when it comes to learning. And so we asked the children in a yes or no questionnaires, if they think that the acquired um, learning independence might be a as a result of why some of the children are not coming to school and about 43 percent of the children replied to us yes they they some of the children don't see the reason to come to school because they're able to learn on their own and this is what the hard lockdown has made them um uh, achieve or what it has motivated them and um, 53 or 57 percent of the children said no they hadn't acquired um, any learning independence and these are the children that said to us you know um, Auntie Yonella we were already struggling with um, learning even before COVID-19 and just with the hard lockdown we were not as motivated to do our schoolwork in school and another huge impact that um, had an impact on the children is the change in routine. Like mentioned earlier, with the schools being closed, new measures had to be introduced for learning um, in terms of online learning and uh, doing the work at home. So some of the children don't even have parents to help them with the work or parents that are able to understand the work for them to help with. So the change in routine definitely had an impact on them. And with the schools reopening, they had to alternate days. So some of the children reported that this system was confusing for them, that, um, they were not always aware of whether it's their day to go to school or not. And also with their sleeping routines. So they said to me, if I'm going to school, then I'll know I'll wake up in time to prepare. But if I'm not going to school, I'm not going to wake up at six o'clock as if I was preparing for school. So now you can imagine if the previous day you woke up at 10 o'clock and the next day you have to wake up at six o'clock. That disruption in routine has had a major impact on the children and even the parents because some of the pair we spoke to parents as well and some of the parents reported that um if i know i'm going to wake up my child for school then i will wake up earlier to prepare but if i know the child is not going to school then i will not be waking up earlier to prepare the child so the change in those um set of although it can be seen as a simple routine but the change in that really disrupted the children and even the way in which the learning uh became for them in schools it was a another drastic change to how they were used to learning and some of the children re re, uh, reported to us that with the very limited time uh on academics everything was now focused on at academics and very less and less attention was given to recreational activities and other non-academic activities which are some of the activities that really motivate the children to go to school and want to be in school because they want to play in the soccer match we even asked in our questions do you miss the recreational activities so even though they are there teachers are not really worried about excelling in sports and all of that because the work needs to be done they feel the pressure of the academic work having to be completed in such a short space of time and such that there isn't really much focus on the non-academic activities and recreational activities and children who excelled and enjoyed these activities have lost their motivation to go back to school and we come to children with existing learning difficulties i must say this was really a difficult topic to talk about with the children especially the children that are experiencing learning difficulties and the slides about um, the community of danun one of the things i might have not mentioned is that even the schools are very crowded so the community is very crowded even the schools are very crowded you find a ratio of um one to one to 50 learners in class 42 learners 
10 is in class. So um, it's a very big ratio. And so there's a lot of um, children that could easily fall through the cracks, especially children with learning difficulties, because now with the time that is remaining for schools to be able to co complete all the academic work and having to um, having to uh, also take note of those children that are struggling, it's, it's really close to being unrealistic. And so the children who already had existing learning difficulties have fallen even further behind with um, the COVID lockdown and also now returning back to school with some of the work being done in class. And if they're not done, they are advised to take the work back home. And it's not necessarily that the following day they will go back to visit what was done in the previous day because we teachers need to get the work done. And so for these children, they were already left behind and now they they left even further behind than their peers. And also peer pressure, which is something that um, impacts young children a lot because young children want to do as their friends do. Young children want to always be with their friends. And so with the alternating days of schools, um, some of the children reported that they were not in the same group as their children, as their friends, I mean. And so they will just stay back on days that they are meant to go to school to be able to play with their friends. And also we asked the children about the anxieties on contacting COVID. And this for me was really surprising because not a very large number of children reported that they were scared of COVID or contacting the virus or um, any other things that are related to the anxieties of, the, uh, uh, of contacting the virus. So the blue, the blue graph represents children who said that they were not scared of contacting the virus. And if you think of it, really the situations or the circumstances of the environment already exposes them so much to contacting the virus such that they will not be afraid to go to school because of contacting the virus. They're already living in crowded areas. They're already living in spaces whereby there's no um, uh, resources, adequate resources for them to be able to sanitize, to wash their hands regularly and to do all of those things. So going to school for eight hours a day does not really have an impact on whether or not they will contact the virus. And just about like it, it, it's shown in the graph that just about nearly 60% of the children reported to us that they were not afraid of contacting the virus or that it was not reason enough for them not to go to school. But all the other reasons, um, uh, what, pro uh, uh, what discouraged them about going to school, especially the one about recreational and non-academic activities not being given as much attention as they were pre-COVID. And so we had some in-depth conversations with some of the children, and I would just like to read the quotes from the children that spoke to us. Um, one child said to me, I struggled with my schoolwork even before lockdown. During COVID, I did not have anyone to assist me with the work, and so I did not bother. Now coming back to school, I am even more behind than my peers. It's hard to be, it's hard and embarrassing to always be the one who doesn't understand the work. And another child said, um, I don't see the use of coming to school. I am able to do the work by myself at home. And one other child said to us, I do very well in soccer and I enjoyed playing for the school team. But now all the focus is on the academics and so school is boring. I know a lot of children who did not come back to school because school is now boring. And one said to me that really broke my heart is that he said to me, I do not like attending the learner support classes, the extra classes, because those learners in that list, we all know as the dumb cops of the class. So they receive special names or very embarrassing names for being in the list of learners who need extra um, support when it comes to their curriculum. Although it's a very necessary service, but for them it's, it, in, it's in such a way that it is embarrassing for them to be known as the dumb cops of the class. And also some positive quote from one of the learners who said to me, um, Auntie Yonela, I think that children should come to school because 
uh, at school, there's teachers to help them with understanding the work. And so you just think to yourself, what, what were the, how did those learners cope during COVID when the teacher was not there to explain to them the work? We also had conversations with parents, um, especially those parents of children who, whose, whose children were reported not to be coming to school. And these are some of the quotes from the parents that uh, we had conversations with. One parent said, I am an illiter illiterate parent. I cannot assist my child with the schoolwork. It seems now most of the work is done at home and my child is struggling. I can see my child's books. He is not doing well, but he keeps being promoted to the next class, so I don't ask. Um, another parent said, my child was deregistered without my knowledge for poor school attendance. I did not notice he was not attending school because he left the house every morning for school. And one other parent reported that I get confused with the alternating days and our children sometimes lie that it's, it's their day off. So as imagined, um, this whole process is difficult on the parents as well. And it might sound like they're making excuses, but these are the realities of the parents in Danun. Um, one parent also said to me, I wake up very early in the morning, I'm unemployed, and I have to wake up very early in the morning and go to the industries nearby, the industrial areas nearby to go and seek jobs and see if I cannot, um, land a job for that day or for that week. And during this time, she leaves the children behind very early with the hope that they will wake up and prepare themselves for going to school. We also, oh, <laughs> that slide repeated twice, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we also had conversations with the teachers as the people that um, uh, do the referrals to us and are always so overwhelmed and complaining. And the teachers had both positive and negative comments to say. And unfortunately, I included all because I'm trying to just draw a bigger picture of it's not that it's not just the children and the families that are impact, um, affected or impacted, but also the teachers. And that has a huge contribution as to how a teacher will teach a learner in class with all these um, uh, underlying issues. So uh, one of the teachers reported to us that parents do not bother themselves with the progress of their children. So parents will not go to school unless they are invited to do so. And they will not go to school just to inquire on how the child is doing. Some of the parents don't even sign the, the, the children's homeworks as they are motivated to do so. And parents are not visible at the school. And one teacher said, we have no knowledge of the school attendance offices. They have never been to our communities or schools, nor do we know how to access them. And I, I think this is such a shame because this is a service that is available to the teachers that could assist in ensuring that ch children are attending schools, but teachers have no access to it to them or they have no knowledge of how they do work. And one of the negative comments I received from the teachers was that um, as a teacher, I work with a learner in class. So I do not bother myself if the learner is not coming in at school because my duty is to work with the children that are available. And another thing I learned is that with the education system, if a child has been absent from school for 10 consecutive days, then the child is deregistered automatically from the school system, which, is, which makes it very hard for the child to be re-registered in the school system and um, be in the registers again. So um, what are the gaps in services that are currently being provided? And as I mentioned earlier in the literature review that I did, that so many studies have been done, but some of this data is not relevant to the children in Danun, as explained. Uh, the non-academic activities uh, can be used as motivation for school in, uh, for for children to be motivated to go back to school. Motivation such as interaction with their peers. So now, as we can imagine, they have to social distance. Even during prayer time, they have to wear their mask, and that has a huge impact on um, interaction. Schools for children in Danun are a safe space. And so with the closure of the schools, those children were constantly exposed to trauma, violence, and abuse at their home settings. And so when they go to school, they go to school to survive. They go to school to be in a safe space. 
recreational and sports activities, especially for those children who, who do so well. It gives them such motivation to know that they're doing something so well and excelling uh, in spite of how they might be doing academically. Uh, speaking to the children themselves and reporting on these conversation is lacking. So um, some of the children, when I spoke to them about this, I said to them, uh, I'm, a, I'm a grown up that is uh, sitting uh, on my level, not understanding what is happening on the ground and not understanding what you guys are thinking. What are some of the reasons why children are not going to school? As I mentioned earlier, I asked the children, if you were to be in a position of power to make decisions with regards to school children and school attendance, what are some of the things that you would put? The children laughed at that activity. They loved it. It was so in engaging with them. It, they interacted so well because they said to me, it's not every day that they get asked for their opinions. Most of the time they are just told what to do without having to give an input, input to what they think should be done, which I really think it's unfair and sad because these are services impacting their lives. These are services intended for them. And so if they're not given in accordance to what they think they need or what they know that they need, then what good are those services really? Uh, the lack of resources to facilitate online training, uh, online learning, as mentioned again earlier, children in Danun do not necessarily have in Danun and other communities that are disadvantaged, which I, I know is a very large number of communities in South Africa, that most of these disadvantaged communities did not necessarily have access to online. Some families do not even have a, a, a smartphone that allows them to have WhatsApp on. And so during this time, how were these children coping with the work? How were they receiving the work? How were they doing their work if they needed to be taught online? And children experiencing pre, sorry, children with pre-existing learning difficulties may need extra support when they return to school, definitely. And also that this support or, or learning system is done in such a way that is not so embarrassing to the children. We try and raise awarenesses about what it means to have learning difficulties. And we always say at Jelly Beans, it's not that you are dumb as the children might perceive it. It's just that your mind or your brain works differently than the other children. And so it needs extra support. And now coming into my recommendations or our recommendations. Um, children from different social backgrounds were affected differently by the pandemic and conversations of what they need to encourage them to go to school should include them. There must be visibility and functionality of other support structures to school, such as the learner support teams, prompt assessment to encourage prompt response to, to learners that are already struggling, um, school attendance offices uh, to be um, to be active and visible in schools and communities. And also regular parent and teacher conversations in, mon in monitoring the attendance, the academics and social learning issues that the children might be experiencing in schools. Existing programs like the ECBND programs could assist in having or facilitating these conversations with the children because they're already having so much contact with the children and encouraging them on returning back to school. Thank you so very much for listening to my presentation. And I am now looking forward to the questions that you guys might have for me. Thank you, Yunela. I'm still in the background. I'm checking for questions. Um, so it takes a little while before it pops on. And then I'll, as, a, as the questions appear, I will, I will read them out to you and, and then give you an opportunity to respond. So anybody have any questions, please pop them onto the Q&A at the bottom um, for those who are attending the session or there are 20 people that have attended. So it's a nice, it's a, it's a nice healthy number of attendees. Well done, Yonella. Um, Thank you. So if there are any questions, just pop them on the Q&A and then I will read them out to Yonella. Um, so let me hear from everybody, anybody who has any questions. <clears throat> I think, Yunella, uh, um, just even from my side, uh, um, you, you know, we, we, there was a slogan once, nothing about, me with, uh, nothing about me without me. And I think that that is actually incredibly powerful in, in, uh, for me that stands out in your study is the fact that, that young people are just not really 
part of the decision making. Um, mm. I remember mm. a school year where the matrix were de where they, were, they decided for their final year they're going to give them a nice tie, and it turned out to be so. Every all the matrix had to go on stage and pick up this tie, and it was sort of a horrible mustard yellow color. Mm. And every young mm. person that came off that stage was they were so unhappy with this that because the adults had made this decision, right? Um, yes. So so and I yeah. Yes, And I think it's so important what you are saying that um, these little voices need to also be listened to, especially with regards to services that affect them. They have so much to say, they have so much opinions, and it, it gives such a great pleasure for them to be listened to. All they really want is to, be to have somebody listen to them. So definitely, I agree with you. Nothing for me without me. Absolutely. I just love that, Yeah. Um... I'm just also saying that um, uh, learner support, uh, learner support structures, or even learner support uh, assistants or learner support agents, as we know them. Um, I don't know if you're aware that that that, that child and youth care workers uh, uh, can actually be employed at schools to be be this part and, and to fulfil this role. It is something that is happening in KZN at the moment, and and they and the, child, the child and youth care workers that are that, that are receiving training or have been trained mm. and are actually mm. helping young people at school. So to also address some of the psychosocial issues around mm. that, perhaps something else for you to to look into, um, just as a, as a as a thought, yeah. Definitely something worth looking into because uh, you know when we're having the conversations with the teachers, you could tell the 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 sort of like the overwhelming emotions and how exhausted they are that they have to go into the communities, look for the children, and I mean for anyone that is exhausting. So the services are not very accessible or very visible in communities that are really needed the most. I think that's so that's definitely something worth looking into. Yeah, yeah, true. But it, it's something that I think again in your study, and this is something uh, uh, um, that, that that stood out for me is again your your poorest communities are the ones that seem to struggle the most, especially for the young people uh, and their children, uh, um, and and around and around the pandemic and and what 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 that has mm. what that has caused. But something else that just stands out for me is 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 um, I like what you said, my your brain works differently, and I think that that's perhaps something else that needs to be looked at. Is 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 mm. you know we we talk about brain friendly learning. How do you have have young people be excited about their learning again and 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 again i think it's it's something that we we forget that children think differently or we all think differently some of us are very theoretical others are very good with our hands others are musical others are dance others mm. are and I mean, those those all are forms of learning. Those all are, are ways in which children can excel, in which children can show their true potential. There's, so, there's a vast of careers and um, uh, opportunities for children in each field, such that I think most of the time we only focus on the formal kind of learning, forgetting to include those kind of children. And in communities that are very disadvantaged, services such as um, the school educational assessment, psychoeducational assessments are things that are not done at an early age. And you find that a child, by the time that the, 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 these learning difficulties are visible and recognized, it's already in a time whereby it's too late. The child has been struggling with all of this so much for over the years that now they are just at a breaking point. I had a parent who said to me, and it's so strange the way in which my child is reacting with regards to coming to school. In the morning, he becomes furious. He refuses to come to school. But I had when I had in-depth conversation with this parent, they reported that they've seen that the child is struggling. The, the, the child's books, there's clearly shows that the child has been struggling, but because they're just promoted to the next class and promoted and no proper interventions have been put in place for them because they're not easily accessible or available to them. Now the child is at a point whereby he's tired of being embarrassed in front of the peers, being told that he needs to attend learner uh, extra support or being told that they're dumb or they just don't understand. And he knows all of this and he also doesn't understand why he's not understanding at the same level as his peers so definitely it's 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 sad uh, it, it is indeed uh, i mean i remember and, and i and i just think with the COVID lockdown it highlighted not more than just introducing new problems but also highlighted problems that were already there but just kind of not so at a bigger scale for us to notice and now with all of this happening it has kind of like highlighted all of these issues and brought them in such a bigger scale that children just can't take it anymore 
And it sounds that way. Yeah, you say the kids, the kids have had enough. It's, it's been a struggle from, from, from grade one up until where they are. And, and, and um, I think there was another study at one stage, um, or somebody actually said to me the other day, we're talking about 750,000. I think you also mentioned it now. 750,000 yes. children that don't want to go back to school. Mm. And that is a problem. Um, and that is, that, is, that is a serious, serious... That is a large number. That is a serious issue that needs, that needs, you know, needs to be looked into. Um, yeah, Yonela, there have been no questions. Um, I just want to see if there's any, uh, if anybody has left comments anywhere. So, um, um, yeah, let me just check in quickly here. Um, if there are any comments. Um, but I'm not seeing, seeing any questions popping onto the, onto the chat. Um, yeah, let's give it another minute or so, I think, before, 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 we, before we close the session. Um, I think I think it just means that I'm a very clear presenter and I should maybe consider a career in education and teaching. <laughs> hey, you can only get better and I agree with you. You, you actually, <laughs> definitely, you, 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 it, was, it was an excellent presentation. I, I can't fault you on that. <laughs> um, but I think it's just really very informative and I think it's very necessary. And, and, and as you said, COVID has really just put the spotlight on a lot of the, 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 the more serious, the more serious concerns and issues that our young people are experiencing, hmm. um, uh, experiencing out there. Um, so, yeah. Um, and if anything, I just, I just hope that these are issues that will now come into light and actually be more looked at moving forward. Well, absolutely. That 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 needs to be done, and, and and I wonder if that shouldn't perhaps become one of the resolutions for the conference is to is to is to put forward. You know, you know, can we? You know, can can the departments or bring bring to the attention of the Department of Education that there are more critical things that need to be looked at. Um, I've never been a, a fan of, 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 you know, one school for all kind of thing. It's, 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 it's mm. you have so many people thinking differently and it's, and it's, you know, putting a young person on the, on the, on the, on the back foot from day one is really just not cool. Right? Yeah. So, mm. yeah. Um, all right. Um, Jonella, there've been no other questions. Um, so I would like to just very thank you from the bottom of everyone's heart and my, my own in particular that uh, for your presentation has been very informative. And um, just to just to say to you that um, you know, well done on your research. I think you've definitely highlighted a number of very critical issues that 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 will need to uh, be brought to the attention of the education department. Mm. And I think just that um, obviously we're looking and needing um, or requiring a much more collaborative effort in how we get our young people to a level of education that they can that they can that they can also go further with this. Um, um, I had the privilege yesterday of, of, of listening to a young man who's part of a, a different international program which focuses on the psychosocial support as well as teaching them about um, 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 certain economics and how they how to work with money and how to be able to find work and, and work with what what is available. So just again, yeah. um, I'm picking up. I, I, looks like I had a thread. This my thread going through was 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 this kind of scenario of you know yeah. the education part of everything and and and, and it's, it's one of my pet peeves. Uh, you know, and so I was privileged to be able to listen to you and just want to say thank you very very much. Um, enjoy the rest of conference and uh, all the yeah. best. Enjoy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.